Thank you very much, Charles. Um, thank you all for giving me this time to, to share my heart with you today. Um, today we're going to speak, I'm going to share about a topic that I've been thinking about for a long time, and that is the idea of art as an act of hospitality. We've, we've talked about what hospitality has looked like for a couple of you in this last year, um, a very difficult year. So how can art be an act of hospitality? So let's back up a minute and think about how we consider hospitality traditionally. Now, is this hospitality? So I'm an American. I'm from the South, from South Carolina. And we love our peaches. We love our baked goods. You put them together and you've got magic. I think this would be considered traditionally hospitality. What about this? Is this hospitality? You've got a beautiful place setting. You've got extravagance. You've got clearly people have put a lot of time into making this. You feel welcome. I think I would never take my children to this dinner. Um, but do you think this is hospitality? Is this hospitality? The church greeters. There are entire ministries built around welcoming people into church. What about this? Is this hospitality? Take a look at this for a moment. This is one of my favorite paintings. Charles introduced us to it yesterday. Um, I'd like to go a little bit more in depth. So here Caravaggio shows Jesus and only three apostles, which is unique in an undefined space. As though he has a camera lens, he's zooming in so that we're much closer to the scene. And shockingly, Jesus allows, perhaps even invites, Thomas to stick his finger inside of the wound. See how the light catches the flap of skin raised by his finger? I think this image is about as visceral as it gets. So before Caravaggio, nobody had composed an image about the doubting Thomas with such an intense focus on the wound. All four of the figures are staring intently as it penetrates his side. You can see the expressions on their faces. We're going to come back to our doubting Thomas later, but first I wanna talk about another word, symbol. The origin of this word is the Greek word symbolon and originally, it was an object called the tessera hospitalitas. It was a little object about the size of your thumb. It was a tile of welcome. And when a stranger came to your home, before they crossed the threshold to sit at your, your table and enjoy hospitality with you, this little tile would be broken right in half, like right where the hand is shaking. One half would be given to the guest and something like this would be said. From this day forward, you and whoever you share this piece of tile with is welcome in my home, but the two pieces must be fitted together. That vow could extend up to generations of strangers. If they could fit it to the other piece, they would be welcome. So that's what a symbol was. But what I find most powerful about this is that it was in the act of the breaking that the welcome took place. Now, of course, the word symbol has since taken on metaphorical richness and a symbol doesn't mean one thing in one direction. It means multiple things in multiple directions and many layers of meaning can be embedded in a symbol, just like with art. As artists, we, when we create, we want other people to receive what it is that we're offering. Art isn't meant to be experienced in a vacuum. We want to give ourselves away in the act of making and hope that there's someone on the other end to hold that piece of tile and fit it together with ours. It's in the breaking though, that the mystery of hospitality takes place. And of course, the ultimate symbol is Christ himself. 
God said, you know what? Something has to be broken. And he was willing to be broken so that we could come to his table. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. That's the ultimate form of hospitality, I believe. God entered our story instead of simply demanding that we enter into God's story. So what I'm thinking is that this is what best defines hospitality. When we practice it, we say, I want to be a part of your story more than I hope that you'll become part of mine. So I think we can say that hospitality is not about cookies and it is not about um, greeters. It's about making space for the other. So what are some other ways that we can think about making space? If you think about it, it's the negative space in a painting that helps us to make sense of what we're seeing. It is the pause in a musical piece that allows the rhythm to flourish in a meaningful way. I want to take a look for a minute at a hymn. This is a Charles Wesley hymn. This is a verse from Let Earth and Heaven Combine. And consider what Charles Wesley had to say about space. Let earth and heaven combine, angels and men agree, to praise in songs divine the incarnate deity, our God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man. So space, let me comment on that word span. At the time that this song was written, the span referred to the length of a human hand from the tip of the thumb to the tip of the little finger. This is not a large space. And imagine the Godhead being contracted to a span. When speaking literally to create space, you shrink or remove something to allow for the presence of something else. The philosopher David Bentley Hart talks about beauty as an expanse, as an empty space between now and what is to come. A space for longing, mystery, lament, or other strong emotions and desires. But it's often the case that our communities and especially our churches are not good at holding this kind of space. We move quickly away from discomfort, ambiguity, intense emotion, silence, especially in the United States. We fear questions that don't have easy answers, but it's important to remember that Jesus taught with more questions than answers. He spoke in parables and he instructed in art. First type of space that our communities, that artists can hold in our communities is inquisitive space. Understanding beauty and mystery as an expanse between the already and the yet to come. We need space to work out the realities and the brokenness between the world as we know it right now and the joy of the coming kingdom. And artists can hold that space. Another type of space that I believe artists can help us hold is relational space. The space between an individual and another, whether it's human or divine. It becomes an opportunity to create beauty. And I think that when artists are attuned to the culture, personality, and individual needs of their communities, they create work that is filled with dynamism and relationship. Their work becomes a gift and not an act of egoism. From the very beginning, ministry-minded people have understood the importance of a cultural context. That's why Paul said this to Timothy, to the weak I become weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. He sounds a little egotistical, but that's Paul. When we learn to see those around us, as Charles taught, then our work communicates more than the fingerprint of the artist. It's more than me. There's this inescapable voice, a presence that comes through in our art. We are the conduits, the catalysts. We're unique, and we can't escape that uniqueness, nor should we try. 
yet it's in the willingness to enter into an act of communion with people that we connect. And this requires submission. You have to let down your guard to actually be in communion. It's an act of vulnerability, of risk, to welcome someone to your table. What if they, what if they don't want to come? To set aside space for them. I wanna take a minute and consider these words from Athanasius. The Lord did not come to make a display. He came to heal and to teach suffering men. For one who wanted to make a display, the thing would have just been to appear and dazzle the beholders. Do you know any artists like that? But for him who came to heal and to teach the way was not merely to dwell here, but to put himself at the disposal of those who needed him and to be manifested accordingly as they could bear it, not vitiating the value of the divine, appearing by exceeding their capacity to receive it. So I think about some of those words, not just to appear and dazzle, but to put himself at their disposal, perfectly fitting their capacity, their, their space to receive. So when artists are guided by the spirit, when artists view their work as a gift, they're not going to exceed the viewers or the hearers or the reader's capacity. This is not art for art's sake. This is art for the sake of the other. So I wanna take a break and go to small groups, but before that, I wanna consider one more voice. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis in his novel, The Great Divorce. Um, if you're not familiar with this piece, uh, the context is, this is a, a fantastical allegorical novel about a narrator who has gone from, uh, from hell, he's taking a bus ride to heaven. And George MacDonald is his guide. And so it, those who are not yet in heaven are the ghosts. And this is a conversation between a ghost and a spirit. All right. When you painted on earth, at least in your earlier days, it was because you caught glimpses of heaven in the earthly landscape. The success of your painting was that it enabled others to see the glimpses too. But here you are having the thing itself. It is from here that the messages came. Why, if you're interested in the country only for the sake of painting it, you'll never learn to see the country. Now the ghost, but that's just how a real artist is interested in the country. No, you're forgetting, said the spirit. That was not how you began. Light itself was your first love. You love to paint only as a means of telling about light. Oh, that's ages ago, said the ghost. One grows out of that. Of course, you haven't seen my later works. One becomes more and more interested in paint for its own sake. One does indeed. I also have had to recover from that. It was all a snare. Ink and catgut and paint were necessary down there, but they're dangerous stimulants. Every poet and musician and artist, but for grace, is drawn away from the love of the things he tells to love of the telling, till down in deep hell, they cannot be interested in God at all, but only in what they say about him. For it doesn't stop at being interested in paint, you know. They sink lower, becoming interested in their own personalities and then in nothing but their own reputations. I want to go to one more thought from Lewis. And uh, here, let's share this. My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through those of others. I am never more myself than when I do. I think that's a powerful quote. And I think it's really important as we consider what the purpose of art is.
as I read this, I think again of Caravaggio's Doubting Thomas. I see him anew. I see Jesus Christ with his broken flesh contracting around Thomas's fingers as they fill up the emptiness of Jesus's wounds. Caravaggio humanizes Thomas for us. The expression on his face, his lips parted, suggests that that wound is tender. This image is a, a breaking open and then a reconnecting, and that's what our art can do. I see hospitality. I see a tessera hospitalitis, two tiles broken and then reconnected. I see beating pulse on beating pulse. The lesson of the Thomas story then is not just that we should believe in the resurrection without seeing, needing to see or touch to believe. It's that Jesus invites us to see and to touch him. He invites us to encounter his broken, wounded, and glorified body. He welcomes us to feast at his table. So when we exercise hospitality in our art, when we think about art for the sake of the other, we open up space for the triune God to enter in. And I want to just finish with a song. I'm going to put the lyrics up. Hopefully you'll see them. Um, they're powerful. There's a lot of contrast, a lot of symbol, a lot of hospitality. And I'd ask that you would just experience this song as a prayer. Oh, 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 oh. 